Our theme for this morning is simply Lamb and Snags at the Barbie. We're going to take a few moments to look particularly at um, these verses 15 through to 17 of John chapter 21. The setting has been clearly outlined in previous studies, and we will therefore not spend a a lot of time uh, developing that thought. But let me just indicate briefly that Peter and the other disciples have, just prior to this experience, been invited to share in what becomes a breakfast with Jesus after their night of unrewarded toil. They have gone out in the boat, they have fished all night, they have caught nothing, but now in the morning, this experience that they are enjoying and which Peter will now be confronted with is overshadowed by the miraculous catch of fish that was introduced, instigated, implemented by the command of Jesus, where they return and cast out their net under the direction of the Almighty, and here they receive this miraculous catch of fish, the sole result of the authority and the sovereignty of Jesus. Now they have come on shore, and uh, they have made a contribution to the meal, but they have shared in this breakfast of bread and fish, a little bit reminiscent of the loaves and fishes that became an object lesson to them uh, at the beginning of the ministry of Christ and their involvement with him as his disciples. They have been learning through the demonstrations of Christ's authority that everything that he spoke of in his ministry has come about. He is now coming to the end of his earthly ministry and is demonstrating as never before in the clear light of reality that he is whom he declared himself to be the Son of God. His crucifixion, his resurrection have been the key notes, the key features, the pillars upon which that truth has been embedded now in the mind and heart of these disciples. Now, after the meal has come to an end, or at least is coming to an end, Jesus now turns his attention once more to Peter. There have been those occasions in the past where Peter has figured predominantly in the lessons taught by Jesus. You often read of Peter, James, and John being singled out and given a special view of the work of Jesus at particular occasions. But while Peter has uh, figured predominantly among the disciples right throughout the entire ministry of Jesus. We know that it has not always been for the right reason. There have been those occasions where Peter has seemingly stepped out of line simply by rushing ahead or by being diverted in another direction. And he has altogether, because of distractions, has failed to fully understand the message that Jesus has been given. And yet, Peter stands out. And if we were to ask for um, a a, a confession of, of who the disciples of Jesus were, if I were to ask you, name one of the disciples of Jesus, there is every possibility that you would name Peter, because Peter is the one that seems to spring very readily and very easily and quickly to mind. Perhaps not many would mention Bartholomew, 
because we don't hear an awful lot about Bartholomew apart from the fact that he was there with the other disciples. But we know that in the life of Peter, there were times that Jesus, in a sense, drew him out from the other disciples simply by commending him, particularly at those crucial moments and with those crucial elements of his ministry. Who do men say that I am? Was one question posed to the disciples. And as they reasoned among themselves, it was Peter who begins to lay out the thinking, the modern, present, contemporary thinking of their time. Oh, some believe in reincarnation. They think that you're one of the prophets, perhaps even Elijah, back from the dead, and so on. And as they engage in this kind of discussion, Jesus then puts his finger upon their heart and condition. Who do you say that I am? You see, when all is said and done, it doesn't matter what others say about Jesus. The crucial question is, who do you say that he is? We will not be judged upon the thinking of other men and women around us, our peers, or even our family or friends, or even those within the church with us. We're not going to be asked what they thought of Jesus. Every man will give account of himself, Paul reminds us. And here is Peter And Peter confesses, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now Jesus places, as it were, this benefit and blessing upon Peter and simply says, Peter, you are truly blessed because flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. And so Peter now feels so good because He has been commended by Jesus. But not long afterwards, in fact, at the end of this conversation where the subject matter changes and Jesus now begins to contemplate his decease, his death upon the cross, his ultimate resurrection from the dead, and then eventually his return to the Father. Peter is somewhat less pleased with this conversation. And we read in that 16th chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew that eventually Jesus has to chastise Peter. So one moment he is being elated and the next moment he's being deflated because of the nature of Peter. These both happen within a short period of time, a short process. There were times that Jesus had to speak gently to Peter. Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. Other times Jesus had to speak sternly to Peter. Get behind me, Satan, for you savor not the things of God, but the things of men. There were other times when all it took was a look. And remember when Jesus stood in the judgment hall of Pilate and Peter out there by the fire of coals denied his Lord three times. Jesus looked at Peter, and Peter saw the look, and immediately he wept as he left in shame from that courtyard. Here in John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17, Peter is about to engage in the first recorded conversation 
with Jesus following his denial of him. He has spent some time in the locked room and there he has engaged with Jesus, but all of the other disciples apart from Thomas were there. The second time Jesus appeared, likewise Peter was there, and Thomas this time with the others, and they shared in that brief conversation as the topic was peace in a troubled world. But now, this conversation would be different. This is the third time we read in verse 14 of John 21 that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. But now we reach a moment when the conversation turns to Peter. And this time it would be different. Three key features of this conversation. One, it would be personal. Two, it would be penetrating. Three, it would be probing. Now, when we put all of that together, we come up with the one word, convicting. Here is Peter, having gone through so much with Jesus and on behalf of Jesus, but now he stands about to be challenged yet again. And this time, the personal probing and penetrating questions of Jesus are going to strip him of all the externals and expose his heart to his Savior. If Peter is to graduate from the school of faith, he must engage in these true searchings of the heart. So as he stands now by the fire, he gets a grilling, which the others do not get. His robust and almost arrogant display of bravado, and uh, boldness now hits a snag. Jesus is now not looking for a doing response. And Peter was very good at the doing responses. But Jesus is now looking for a loving response. Just quickly flashing into your mind, I'm sure, come the experiences and the expressions of Mary and Martha. Doing and loving. So now Peter is about to be exposed. Jesus does not ask Peter, Peter, will you fight for me? He's already proved that he would. He does not ask, Peter, would you die for me? Peter has already said he would. But what Jesus now asks is, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And how often we fall short short in our faith because we fail to understand that the true value of our commitment to Christ is not in the doing, it's in the loving. We love him because he first loved us. What came from his love for us? The cross, the manger, the resurrection, the ascension, his coming again. But none of these things would have mattered had he not first loved us. And you and I may be content that we are busy in the Lord's work. We are doing this and that for Jesus. But if our heart 
is not poured out in true love for him, then we have missed the point. And it is this soul-searching now that Peter has to understand as Jesus confronts him in his need. Peter has, of course, already boasted of his love for Jesus. Come with me to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19. And look at the comment of Peter. The question that has been asked is, who then can be saved? One of the most important questions of the Bible. You link that with the other by the Philippian jailer who asked, what must I do to be saved? And there you have the two key thoughts of the gospel. Who then can be saved? What must I do to be saved? And as Jesus gives the answer, Peter comes in with this thought. With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You see, no one else can save but Jesus. Who can be saved? He knows. How will we be saved? He does the work. With everyone else it's impossible, but not with God. Now Peter brings in his thought. Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Notice this again is a doing thing with Peter. We have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Peter has expressed, in a sense, his love for Jesus in that he has said, look, we have forsaken everything to follow you. Does that not mean that we love you? And then come down into the 26th chapter of Matthew. Matthew 26, and look at verse 33. In verse 31, Jesus has um, told his disciples, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Now notice the words of Peter. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Even if these other disciples all forsake you and flee, I will not. Now with that thought in mind, we come back over into John 21 and look at verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you, the emphasis on the do you, do you love me more than these? Even if these, Peter had said, forsake you, I will not forsake you. Now Jesus asks, do you love me more than these? Do you think that your love is more genuine, more sincere, more mature? It's deeper than the love that all the other disciples have for me. Do you love me more than these. We could argue that Jesus also included the boat and the net and the fish and the barbecue on the shore, the old life that was major with Peter prior to his call of God. But here he is speaking expressly 
in connection and relation with the other disciples. Now, before we begin to examine the response of Peter, I want you to come with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, these are familiar verses. We have read them so often. You hear them quoted and possibly even preached on, particularly at um, weddings. And here we have the template, the gauge by which our love for Christ and for his people is measured. Let's just read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 7. Here now is the biblical definition of love. And in understanding this biblical definition of love, we have to place it in its proper context where the Bible tells us God is love. Now let's read what these verses say. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And here's the summary. Love never fails. What about Peter? Had Peter always been perfect in demonstrating his love for Christ? Love never fails. Now then, note the questions put by Jesus to Peter, and then Peter's response. Three times, one each in verse 15, 16, and 17, Jesus asks, Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times, Peter replies, You know that I love you. Now, here is the interesting concept. <clears throat> if we were to thoroughly examine the tense and the, the words that are used by both Jesus and Peter, we would note some interesting comments. One is that in verse 15, and in verse 16, that is the first and the second question, do you love me? The word that Jesus uses here for love is agapoa, or agape, uh, as we refer to it. It is representative of a spiritually inspired divine love. Do you love me? Now, in the first two responses of Peter, Peter uses a different word for love. And it is the word filial, or we would refer to filial love. And that love is a response of the heart that draws on an affection for the one to whom that love is addressed. <clears throat> so, Peter responds, you know that I love you. That is, with this affection. It's an attraction that develops into an affection and leads to a commitment. So Jesus asks, Do you love me, agape, with the love of God? 
Peter responds, I love you with all my heart. And then you will notice that only these two words are used. For when we come to the third expression in verse 17, when Jesus asks, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Jesus now comes down from the agape to the filial love. And he meets Peter where Peter is able to respond. Do you really love me with all your heart? And Peter responds, You know all things. You know my weaknesses. You know my failures. You know my faults. You know my fears. But you know my heart. And you know that I love you with all of my heart. Now, we need to understand that this word uh, filial in terms of our love for Christ can be both divine or humanly inspired. In fact, there are several times, and we won't go through that today, but there are several times where both of these words are used to describe the Father's love for the Son and the love of Jesus for his people. But what is happening here is Jesus is reminding Peter that his love, if it is only purely physical and emotional, will not enable him to love as God loves. We need to have our human affection motivated, driven by, accelerated by a love that comes from God. What is the key feature of the child of God? The love of God is shared abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so Jesus asks, do you Love me. Now, what does this word mean? How can it be expressed? Well, come over with me to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. And in Mark 12, uh, verses uh, 28 to 30, you'll see Jesus again under the scrutiny of the scribes. The Pharisees have already had their say and uh, they have asked a question about marriage and divorce and now the scribes come and they want to, uh, to drive a point even more deeply into the, the ministry of Jesus. Uh, verse 28 of Mark 12, then one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, let's break that down. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart. That is, with all its affection. You will love the Lord your God with all your soul. That is, all its attraction. You will love the Lord your God with all all your mind, that is, with all its affirmation. 
You will love the Lord your God with all your strength. That's its application. Every part of us, body, soul, and mind, captivated with a love for God. But notice how Jesus questions Peter. He did not say, do you love what I do for you? He did not say, do you love how I make you feel? He asked, do you love me? Now, if we can answer that as Peter answered and said, Lord, you know. You know my heart. You know all things. You know that I love you. If we can say that, it means that Christ has our affection, attraction, affirmation, and application. We will not fall or give in to our distraction. Poor Peter had often been distracted. His love had been flawed. It was not perfect. He must now face the challenge of this probe. Notice his honest reply. You know that I love you. With all of my being, I love you. But he stops at that. He is no longer comparing his love with the love of the other disciples. He is no longer boasting that he somehow has a a superior kind of relationship with Jesus. He recognizes now his limits and his dependence upon Christ. You know that I love you. He cannot make a God of works. He must trust the work of God. Verse uh, 16, the question is posed and the response is repeated in the same way. Again, in verse 17, Jesus now applies the same word as Peter, filio, and Peter responds, in the same way. But notice how Jesus renews the call of of Peter and and draws out this special commission to Peter. In the early part of the chapter, they have been sent out to cast their net over the side of the boat. And they catch a load of fish. Remember, Jesus has already told them he will make them fishers of men. So, in the early part of the chapter, we see the work of evangelism. They are to go out and reach the lost. But now in verses 15, 16, and 17, we see two other ingredients in this commission that Christ has given. Verse 15, feed my lambs. Verse 17, feed my sheep. How do we feed the flock of God? We preach the Word. And then look at verse 16. Jesus said to Peter, if you really love me, tend my sheep sheep. That's pastoral care. So here are the three ingredients. Evangelism. Preaching and teaching the Word. And caring for the flock. Shepherding the flock. Peter now has ringing in his ears the Word of Jesus. I give unto you the keys of the kingdom. And Peter, having failed, wonders, can I ever be reinstated to that position? 
Jesus now comes to Peter and asks, Peter, do you love me? I love you. Do you really love me? I really love you. Do you really, really love me? I really, really love you. And Jesus said to Peter, here are the keys of the kingdom. How many times have we failed? How many times have we felt that we have somehow lost out in the call of God upon our lives and it's too late now to do anything about it and yet how often Jesus comes to ask us, do you love me? That's what matters. Can you serve me? You may say, well, I don't think so. But if Jesus asks, do you love me? Can we say, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And if your love for him is genuine, then he will equip you to do whatever he calls you to do. Because he will know that you were not seeking your own glory, but you were seeking his glory. Do you love me more than anything or anyone else? That's the question for our heart today. Let's bow for prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for your word and pray your blessing upon us as we continue to meditate upon it. May we see in the maddening crowd around us all of the frivolous activities of a false emotion as multitudes are being swept into the frenzy of unbelief and self-seeking. Your word confirms and confers upon your people the need to turn our back upon the world, not to be conformed to it or attracted by it. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. And as we are challenged to be Christians, as we are challenged to stand up for the cause of Jesus in this difficult world, we pray that you will give us such a love for Jesus that will go beyond our normal, uh, personal, and practical, and physical ability so that we will love Jesus with a love that is unique, a love that is inspired, a love that has been planted in our heart by the Holy Spirit, so that all of our affection, our attraction, all of our affirmation, and all of our applications will center around him and him alone, so that we will not only love him, but we will grow to be like him in all that we are and do and say. Father, we thank you that you know our heart, and we pray for the grace that we need today to confirm your call upon our lives as you commission us afresh to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And this we pray in our Saviour's name. Amen.